the 2017 edition of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union ICT Week and Symposium was held in Antigua and Barbuda, March 20th to the 24th. The symposium included the 34th Executive Council meeting, the Smart Caribbean Conference, Cybercrime and Cybersecurity, ICT for Persons with Disabilities, and the 15th Caribbean Ministerial Strategic ICT Seminar, which was facilitated on Day 2 and Day 3 of the symposium. The mission of the CTU is to facilitate Caribbean development by fostering effective use of information and communications technology. Day 2 and 3 focused on the impact of ICT on the financial sector. Mobile money, cryptocurrency, and blockchain technology were major topics of discussion. We also saw the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the CTU and BIT. Selby Wilson, telecommunications strategist consultant, outlined the role and function of the CTU. One has to understand the CTU's role. The CTU is not an implementation agency. But it is an agency which has the responsibility to keep the governments in the region informed and aware of the technology trends, of the regulatory trends, of, of, of new services being provided by ICTs. Uh, we have a responsibility to engage in the development of awareness building exercises, of cajoling, of of encouraging people to go the route. So that, uh, and that's one of the reasons why every year we run a ministerial seminar. The ministerial seminar has been designed to bring the ministers up to date on what's happening. Hopefully that information would inform their policy making procedures. Um, I, I would admit that there's a disconnect. We don't always get the feedback from the members as to how our work has helped them. Right? But if I look at Minister Nicholson yes. here in Antigua, yes. Minister Nicholson is up to the times. Is up to scratch. He 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 participates in all the CTU events. He's a strong supporter of the CTU, and I have every reason to believe that he's using some of the things we bring to the table in his policy-making decision process. Melford Nicholas is the Minister of Communications and Information Technology in Antigua and Barbuda. With over 25 years in the telecommunications industry, he shared his thoughts on cryptocurrencies and the possible challenges created by regulations and the disruptive nature of ICT. But just some thoughts that I wanted to share on this notion of cryptocurrencies. Maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, we saw the emergence of Bitcoin and the whole BitChain and the whole cryptocurrency um, evolution. And there have been several other alt currencies or alt coins as they call them, ALT, again, alternate, um, the alternate to uh, Bitcoins. But these cryptocurrencies are uh, its new and emerging technology. And the amazing and perhaps maybe even more troubling aspect to the emergence of these currencies is that the international financial regulatory environment is not quite sure how to deal with them. The legal status of these currencies, as we style and call them, uh, there is no one single treatment of them because the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States and a certain judge in the United States have made a determination that they're going to treat cryptocurrencies as assets for tax purposes, not as a currency, but as an asset. The other troubling thing about these cryptocurrencies is that like Job, the greatest thing that the international money markets fear financial sector fears has come up upon it because cryptocurrencies allows and affords anonymity in terms of trading value. The whole notion that the ledger process that supports the sole cryptocurrencies is in a decentralized manner. So again, the whole notion of uh, 
the administrative convenience of being able to look at them in the traditional way that we will be able to track uh, the movement of monies in the, in the regular international financial system is under threat as well. And so it makes regulations a bit more of a challenge. Personal persons who are now the early adapters, and early adapters, I often refer to them sometimes as, as suckers, excuse the language. But many persons who run to adapt these new technologies without the standards being fully established are sometimes run the risk of being exploited because there has been fraud, noted fraud, in association with these cryptocurrencies. You would be aware through your own reading that um, several of these Bitcoin exchanges have collapsed and have disappeared overnight. And persons have lost millions of dollars in, in investments. So these are some of the issues that I'm sure that uh, the ministers and uh, financial experts and uh, policy makers, senior policy makers in each of our jurisdictions are going to have to come to grips with in terms of the particular challenges that we are now going to be faced with in respect of the disruptive nature of ICTs. And again, as I alluded to last evening, it is not that we should have a fear about it, but that we should embrace it and come to a wholesome understanding. Because at some point in time, we are going to be, it's going to become a common use facility. The digital citizens that are going to fast become the majority of global population uh, are not going to be constrained by the use of these new methodologies for exchanging value and for even adopting them as their preferred currencies. Cash as we know it is going to become a thing of the past. How exactly is the CTU using this symposium to facilitate and enable the region when it comes to mobile money and blockchain technology? We are breaking into three working groups. One to consider cryptocurrencies, one to consider the Caribbean SUSU, and another working group to consider the exchange capacity system of doing trade. And hopefully out of that, in, in the cryptocurrency, we hope to establish a working committee, multi-stakeholders that will continue to look at the issues and see if they can come up with suggested solutions to those issues. And from then on, each country will have to take it and run with it. And hopefully they'll do it at a pretty fast Hopefully they do that. A lot of countries are already using mobile money. Yes. Africa is leading the world in the use of mobile money. M-Pesa is, uh, is mobile money. They're leading the world. And they had to do that because they had a large on-bank population over a diverse and difficult territory. And the mobile phones provided the solution created that space. to provide mobile money. So we cannot afford to wait 15 years to get on board with, with these new developments, otherwise you'd be left behind. It, it would be like the Industrial Revolution, where we miss the boat, and we don't want to miss the boat. What is mobile money and blockchain technology? Oliver Gale, co-founder and CFO of BIT, and Ashish Gadness, CEO of BankU Inc., a blockchain-based identity platform, paint a clearer picture. First of all, mobile money and blockchains are very compatible. Right? Um, the interoperability um, question is entirely solved with the use of blockchains, which is, again, a distributed database that people reach consensus on. Um, your question of whether the money is real. So um, the usage of a trust account is absolutely best practice, and it's something that BIT is doing in its deployment of a blockchain um, backed mobile money. So the question of whether that money is, uh, is backed, well, the answer is it's backed by the central bank. It's definitely not backed by underlying assets, which means you're placing your bets on the integrity of the underlying economy, which um, yeah, maybe is not a great bet at this time. So when you see alternative assets like Bitcoin, 
which is a, uh, a decentralized form of value with a finite supply. Um, you know, you see, we've seen since 2009, but roughly every year the market cap doubles. It was around 12 billion last year, it's 25 billion. One Bitcoin last year was 450 US this year, it exceeds the price of gold. That is because faith in the integrity of the underlying currency issued by governments is collapsing and people are running to assets like precious metals and uh, distributed cryptocurrencies. Um, which provide a mathematical um, proof-driven consensus mechanism. So where the central bank ties into this is if you um, have greater integrity in the issuance of government-backed money, um, if you introduce a blockchain, whether it's permissioned or a public blockchain, you have the ability for the people to hold their government and their central bank accountable because the information is accessible and cannot be changed without tremendous cost and it's in the public domain so it can't be concealed. So if you start at the first layer of the money supply and you address the instrument of legal tender and make that more accountable to people and interoperable on a blockchain, then you can still maintain the legal trust which is to protect now against the risk of the private entity defaulting. So you take a digital legal tender and you place it in a segregated legal entity and then when you have a question of is my money backed, you can know that it is backed is separate from the risk of a company like BIT but you also know that it is backed and unchanged, untampered with um, at the uh, central banking and government level. So really what this does is it restores democracy. And um, again, that's why when we started, we were looking at just Bitcoin. But the problem actually exists across the entire economy. And make no mistake about it, um, as was alluded to, more economic shocks are gonna come down the pipeline. And we are all going to be on the back end of those. So um, really there's actually a, a huge harmony at those at this table because the problems being highlighted and the solutions being offered are all complementary to one another. So now let's go back 5,000 years ago to where blockchain actually began, which a lot of people don't recognize. It was actually in many ways invented in Africa, believe it or not. I spent a lot of time in places like Congo, Rwanda, and Kenya. And here's a very simple example, right? If you've ever been to Africa or a village in Africa or I'm, I'm sure other parts of the world, funerals in the village are paid by the village. This is a very important piece. If you forget everything, remember this is the heart of blockchain, right? So let's just say we're in the village right now, right? What happens? What happens in a village in Eastern Congo? I've spent a lot of time there, right? Everybody in that village collects their 50 Congolese francs, brings it to the mama, right? Stop me if I'm saying something wrong here. And each week, they collect the money from everybody in the village, right? So if somebody dies that following week, the village pays for the funeral, right? Be what's happening in that example versus the first example? In the second example, there are three things happening that define the distributor ledger. And here are the three things. One, there is no centralized authority that says, let me tell you what the funeral is going to be. The entire village participates and makes their contribution, right? So there is a distributor knowledge sharing when it comes to information around everybody contributing towards the funeral. Everybody agrees and the mama holds it, right? If somebody dies, there's a pretty good guarantee that that funeral is gonna be paid for because there was trust in the village around this transaction set. And the third part is because there's consensus, because there's trust, it's pretty hard to cheat, right? I mean, I've, unfortunately, I, I went to a, about a dozen funerals of children who died because of malnutrition, right? It's heartbreaking, but the village pays for the funeral. So the basic definition of the blockchain is this, or the distributor ledger is this, that it is basically data that is equally distributed among a group of actors, in this case could be computers, and there's consensus around that information. 
So I want to demystify some things, right? So cryptocurrency is great, and there's a lot of regulation going to come, but the real opportunity is at, at the street level, at the mama's level, at the farmer's level, at the opportunity at the government level to have now something as simple as registrations of business licenses can be done on the blockchain. And I'll walk through examples of what, I'm, what we're doing in the Middle East and East Africa and Latin America around something as simple as making the small business registration process super easy, efficient for the government, registration of utilities, uh, or for example, granting of uh, loans or microloans to small businesses. Now, what mechanisms have been put in place to advance the ICT agenda by the CTU? The CTU has established a collaborative forum. We started that activity in February last year. We continued it in December of last year, and we formed a regional collaborative committee whose remit is to identify ICT projects which can uh, serve the region and see how we can work in harmony together to get those projects in place. Um, we have established alongside that three working groups one working group dealing with consumer issues, uh, one dealing with the whole idea of convergence, and the other dealing with connectivity issues. We meet to finalize the terms of reference to the working groups and um, give them the mandate. And those are the mechanisms we put in place to try and advance the agendas. Unfortunately, the C2 is not an implementing agency. We can't tell a country they must do they this. They have thing, to, yes. But we can facilitate. Yes. And that's, what, that's our remit. In terms of uh, the ICT infrastructure in the region, uh, yesterday, Tuesday, we looked at a smarter Caribbean, the possibility of us actually just coming fully out of analog, as you say, as soon as possible, as opposed to later. Um, do you think the infrastructure at this point in time is, is, is ready to again jump off? How much work needs to be done? Not from... Uh, my, my own view is that there, there, isn't an inf there is not an a infrastructure deficit. Ah, okay. There's an application deficit. deficit. I think the infrastructure we have Although it can be expanded, the infrastructure can always be expanded and spread more widely. But the infrastructure we have can accommodate some of those things already. There is no reason why all the countries shouldn't have some sort of system for registering motor cars over the internet, for keeping track of those cars. There is absolutely no reason. There is no reason why all the surveillance cameras we're putting up all over the place can't be controlled from a central location. The infrastructure is there to accommodate some of those things. What we have a def deficit in is the innovation, how we use the infrastructure. The same thing with mobile phones. A lot of people who have smartphones don't know how oh, best to yes. use it. That's correct. They, they use it, they're on Facebook, but that's not the only use you can put it. Is there a need for more regional collaboration? I think the governments in the region have to move more rapidly into e-government services to catalyze the use of the technologies. They are the biggest interface with the community, with the, with the citizens, in terms of information, in terms of needs. And they need to address this issue of e-government services, where people can stay in the privacy of their own home and transact business with the government without having to line up. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, MOU that was signed between CTU yeah. and is it BITS? Yeah? Yeah. What exactly is that or what do you hope to achieve from that MOU? Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, I'm happy to enter into this a memorandum of understanding with BIT. And I'm happy for a number of reasons. The first being that BIT is a Caribbean-grown organization 
and as far as I understand, our leaders in the world in the pursuit of bitcoins and blockchain technology. They have been able to attract foreign investment into their company and foreign expertise into their company. And from that perspective, the CTU and BIT have agreed to enter into this memorandum to leverage the strengths of each of the organizations and to promote the use of ICTs not only in the currency space but wherever there are synergies between what BIT is doing and the objectives of the CTU for the Caribbean. So we have today before us two Caribbean organizations innovating, educating and building awareness in the use of ICTs, particularly in the financial services industry. And we are very pleased that BIT and CTU are partners in this venture. I'd now like to invite uh, Mr. Oliver Gale, the President and CFO of BIT, for him to say a few words. Thank you very much. Likewise, it's a, it's a distinct honor and a very proud moment uh, on behalf of BIT and our entire team who have been working with a vision in the Caribbean for what is now many years. And it was nine months ago or so that we happened to cross paths with the wonderful people at the CTU. And after having heard one of my presentations, um, I received a phone call uh, asking to have a meeting, a very excited phone call. And, um, you know, the subject that we covered was, this is exactly what the Caribbean needs. We need to innovate. This is what we've discussed. This is what we talk about. And we want to help. And I must say that um, I've heard that promise before, but the good people at the CTU have carried themselves with the highest levels of integrity and action towards pursuing the ICT initiatives and our own initiatives to provide a digital payments network for the Caribbean region um, and one that is uh, sovereign to this region um, to solve our own mandate of providing financial access to every man, woman, and child. So with that being said, I'm looking forward to a long and uh, successful and fruitful collaboration on meeting our respective objectives, which are largely shared. So thank you very much. The big positive about signing the MOU, we said is we have a regional entrepreneur out of the region whose work has been recognized internationally yes. in, this, in, in the space of blockchain technology and, and trying to develop a niche for alternative forms of currency to do transactions. From that aspect, it is really good that two local Caribbean institutions can get together and collaborate on the use of ICTs, not only in the area of cryptocurrencies or digital currencies, because blockchain technologies can be used for a lot of other, um, a lot of tracking a lot of other kinds of assets and other kinds of... In As we saw this morning, in terms of the explanation. Right? So that from that perspective, there is a commonality between the objectives of the CTU and, uh, and uh, BIT in terms of how do we advance and prepare the region for the use of these technologies in a more sophisticated manner. And that, that is the, the real value. Um, we've signed MOUs with other other organizations outside of the Caribbean and uh, this is the, I think this is the first organization within the Caribbean 
that we found a match for them. And they believe in us, we believe in them. We met them in September in Barbados, and uh, we fell in love. <laughs> I like that, fell in love. This is all 15th Ministerial... Um... 15th Ministerial Conference. Yes. Uh, you've done all 15, have you? Uh, yes, I have done... I've been involved in all, all 15. All of, all of them. What's your expectation coming out of this one, given what we've discussed and, you know, becoming a smart Caribbean? I have high hopes that um, the demonstrations we saw from Huawei, that the information shared uh, by the other speakers, um, I get the feel that it has generated a lot of interest. And, um, and um, I get the impression, I've, I've been told that Antigua has already started talking to Huawei about an e-government services project. So I get the feel that something is going to happen. Something is going to happen. Um, I wish the city had a way of, of keeping track of the things that happen. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> but, um, that definitely and that is not our fault. It is really... <laughs> A, a, a communication problem with the members. They go ahead and do things yes. and they don't necessarily tell us. Yes. Uh, but um, Antigua is doing a lot. Um, in my book, Srinagar has spent a lot of money on ICTs, but they have not accomplished a lot of good results. So we need to step up on the application process there. We need to step up. We can't just spend the money and don't get And expect things to happen just like that. Yeah. I'm very optimistic that we have um, touched the imaginations of the policy makers. And that's key. Um, a little disappointed that uh, more of the ministers from other sectors didn't attend. Because we did invite the ministers of education, the ministers of health, the ministers of national security. Yes, because we've got a cyber security. ICT is a cross-cutting enabler. And, um, some of the things in a smart city is not just financial or ICT in itself. It is how you can use those tools to improve the services to the community, to improve your national security procedures, to improve how you communicate with your citizens, so how you offer services, to deliver the services to your citizens. Um, in, in all fields, in health, education, Oh, hopefully we'll come to that realization soon. Yeah. Before it's too late. Yeah. Yeah? I hope so.